It's a pleasure to be here, and it's especially helpful. It's been helpful today. Today has been a very sad and tired day, and so it's been very helpful to be distracted chatting with some of you and Till, and now to have the opportunity to focus on something more positive. <laughs> so, uh, so some of you have, have, have read the, the paper um, that presents the theoretical framework that I'm going to be presenting here. So, uh, and we, in fact, discussed that earlier today. So it'll, there'll be a little bit, uh, little bit of repetition in the first part of the talk for some of you. I'm just going to begin by saying a bit about the concept of commitment, why I think it's interesting, in particular in relation to joint action, and then present uh, this very rough theoretical framework that uh, Natalie Zevans and Gunter Knoblich and I have developed to structure uh, research on the sense of commitment. And then I'll present a couple of studies that, that we've been doing on the basis of the theoretical framework to, to test some hypotheses generated by it. The one is already published. Uh, this one is very, uh, very current, so it's something we're working on at the moment. So there in particular, uh, it'll be great to get your reactions and suggestions. OK, so just to start with some general uh, preliminaries, joint action is a characteristically human phenomenon. Uh, more than other species, more flexibly and more pervasively, we coordinate our actions with others to achieve uh, changes in the environment. This enables us to achieve outcomes we couldn't otherwise achieve, to do so more efficiently, and also in a way that most people tend to find intrinsically pleasurable. But it also presents us with the challenge of identifying when and to what extent we should rely upon others to make their contributions to our goals and to shared goals, as well as the challenge of identifying when and to what extent we should be motivated to contribute to others' goals or to contribute to shared goals when we might lose interest or be distracted. Commitment can help with this problem because commitments stabilize agents' motivations to make contributions to joint actions, as well as their expectations that others will do so as well. So for example, Till might have woken up today and decided that he didn't uh, feel like uh, <laughs> coming into work. This is actually a very, very real uh, example, perhaps. <laughs> But we, we all knew that well, he's, he's, he's got this commitment to, to, to host me and to be here, and so he's, he's, he's likely to come anyway, because this provides him with a motivation to come. Also provides us with, uh, well, uh, uh, it stabilizes our expectation that he's going to come. So this makes it easier to plan uh, large-scale actions involving multiple agents. It's much easier to plan um, actions together with somebody if you have an idea in advance what they're going to do. Also makes it easier to coordinate uh, the implementation of plans. And it can also stabilize cooperation because commitments make people willing to do things that they otherwise might not be willing to do. A construction worker, for example, uh, might not be willing to spend a whole month working on the construction side unless somebody had made a credible commitment to pay her for doing so. Despite the, I think, crucial importance for, of commitment for characteristically human forms of sociality, there hasn't been much research in psychology investigating psychological processes underpinning the, sen the sense of commitment, or underpinning judgments about commitment. So uh, when, when are people motivated to make their contributions to joint actions, and when do they expect others to do so? What are the psychological processes underpinning that? And also, what are the situational factors that modulate the, 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 the sense of commitment, or modulate judgments about commitment? I think this is in part because the way in which we've understood commitment uh, in, in, in psychology and in philosophy doesn't really lend itself to operationalization uh, nor to, to the articulation of specific testicle, testable hypotheses uh, uh, about psychological processes and situational factors pertaining to commitment. So as a starting point, though, the way in which philosophers have understood commitment and psychologists have, to the extent that they have looked at commitment, had this kind of understanding of commitment in mind. This is not uh, a quote from Bretman, Gilbert, or Searle. It's just sort of a cobbled together consensus definition that I think all of them would agree with. In fact, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they would. So we can understand commitment in a strict sense. Oh, by the way, one more proviso. So this is, uh, this is all pertaining to, com to interpersonal commitment. So of course, there is the concept of commitments that one has to oneself, self-commitment. I'm com committed to quitting smoking or something. That uh, may or may not relate in interesting ways to interpersonal commitments. I won't be talking about that, but it's, it's a worthwhile question to pursue. So we'll just put that aside uh, for the talk, but feel free to ask about it. So commit, interpersonal commitment in the strict sense is a relation among two agents and an action X, such that one agent has an obligation to some other agent to do X 
because she has intentionally expressed her willingness to do X under conditions of common knowledge, and this has been acknowledged. So one thing that this helps us with is it uh, helps to underscore how commitments could fulfill the social function that I've identified of stabilizing motivations and expectations because now when these conditions are met, the other agent can expect the committed agent to do X and can rely upon that expectation. So she can rely upon the committed agent to foreclose outside options that might arise and to resist distraction. However, uh, there are a few points about this definition that I think uh, are worth uh, noting and that, I, and that I think limit its utility for psychology. One is, this is a binary uh, concept, so either these conditions are met or they aren't. Either there's a commitment or there isn't. So it's like a, a pregnancy. Either you have it or you don't. There are no degrees of commitment. Or this doesn't give us any way of understanding how there could be. Also, this is tailored to explicit verbal commitments, obviously. So here, uh, what one has in mind when one thinks of this is promises and other forms of explicit verbal assurance. So the question then is, how could we use this to apply to cases in which commitments arise implicitly? So Margaret Gilbert, to her credit, has identified this as a problem. And uh, while this is the concept of commitment that she has in mind, she's attempted to use it to make sense of implicit commitment. So she asks us to consider the example of Polly and Pam, who are two colleagues, work in the same building, and they are in the habit of getting together and smoking a cigarette and, and uh, chatting a bit on their coffee break every day at 3 o'clock. But they've never made any explicit agreement to do so. In fact, they've never explicitly talked about the fact that they, that they do this. They just do it every day. It's, it's a routine that they're in. So Margaret Gilbert asks us to consider when might this turn into a commitment. So if they do it once, it's not a commitment. But at some point, it might become an implicit commitment. And she says, well, all right, one thing that might happen is that on one occasion, one of them might not show up for whatever reason, and then coming back the following day, offer an explanation or an excuse. She might say something like, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it yesterday. I was sick. And the other one might say, oh, well, I was worried about you. Glad to have, glad to have you back. So now uh, they've acknowledged the appropriateness of offering explanations, uh, excuses, and so indirectly uh, acknowledge that they have obligations and entitlements to each other. So according to Margaret Gilbert, now uh, an implicit commitment is in place. And I think that's uh, a fair observation that that kind of exchange could, could be an important factor. But what the example can also be used to illustrate is that there are many other events that might uh, flip this, this patterned interaction into one in which there is an implicit commitment in place. For example, <clears throat> just consider what difference it might make if they've done this every day for five years compared to just, just three, or four, uh, uh, three or four times. So if, if they've only done it three or four times, it would probably not seem appropriate to offer an explanation, whereas if they've done it for five years, it would seem quite rude not to offer an explanation, uh, having not shown up one day. Similarly, if one of them has to walk up five flights of stairs to get to the balcony where they tend to meet and smoke their cigarette together, then it seems more incumbent upon the other one to warn her in advance or to offer an explanation or apology afterward if she can't show up, because walking up five flights of stairs is an investment that the other is making uh, into this joint action, uh, much more, so it's much, much more incumbent upon her than it would be if her colleague only had to walk around the corner to get to the balcony. So it seems that along with repetition, uh, costs invested might be another factor that can give rise to or enhance a sense of commitment. Similarly, if one of them has a really cool lighter, and so at some point the other one stops bringing her lighter and they just use the really cool lighter every time, then if the one with the cool lighter can't show up. She really has to let the other one know in advance. Otherwise, it's quite rude. So here, what seems to make a difference is the crucialness of her contribution. So this might be conceptualized as uh, the potential future costs. So the other one would, uh, if I don't show up with my cool lighter, and then you have, uh, you have shown up, you've, you've wasted your time getting to the balcony, or you might have to go find another lighter. So it's future costs that you incur uh, because of the crucialness of my contribution. So that could be another important factor. And it's important to note that the strict conception of commitment that I started out with gives us no reason to predict that these factors would make a difference. And it doesn't give us any, uh, any uh, procedure for identifying in advance what factors might make a difference. 
so in addition to these, I've just been considering uh, uh, cases in which there may or may not be an implicit commitment to a joint, commitment to a joint action. And it seems that there are many subtle factors that, uh, that make a difference. Uh, irrespective of whether the, 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 the criteria for commitment in the strict sense are met. I also think it's interesting, in addition to cases like this, where there, we may or may not judge there to be an implicit commitment, there are many cases where we would explicitly deny that there's any uh, commitment at all, and yet nevertheless feel and act as though there were. So just to illustrate that, uh, consider the example of Woofer the dog. If you imagine you're cleaning up your living room, picking up all the objects that you find, books, sweaters, also a tennis ball, and then Woofer, the dog, from across the room, seeing you pick up the tennis ball, thinks this is his cue to play fetch, bounds over, ready to play fetch. Now you might very well feel like, although you didn't intend to play fetch, you didn't want to, you didn't intend to give rise to his expectation, you were kind of committed to doing this. <clears throat> and in fact, the very same factors that we discussed over here might intensify uh, such an experience. So for example, if Woofer <clears throat> is a very old, tired dog and was curled up by the fire and seeing you pick up the tennis ball, gets up and stretches and walks up a couple of stairs even and comes all the way over. Now he seems eager. Now you really have to, have to, have to do this. And again, if you've, if you've done it, if you've played fetch in this particular spot many, many times with him, then you might think, oh, yeah, because of the, because of the, the convention or the repetition, uh, you, you're all the more, all, you feel all the more committed, even though you might not explicitly judge that, that you have a commitment to doing this. So in order to try to make sense of these, these factors that can give rise to implicit commitments or to sort of sub-threshold cases that look a lot like commitment, our strategy has been, rather than starting with the very demanding uh, concept of commitment in strict sense, just to identify, first of all, a minimal structure of situations which could give rise to at least a sense of commitment. And this is what we have started out with. So we've got a goal, which is, <clears throat> well, it's, it's, it's an outcome desired by the one agent, me, and or an outcome toward which me is currently acting. So it could be an outcome desired by me, but toward which me is not particularly acting in the moment. So it could be that uh, the, the outcome is getting my lawn mowed not do anything because uh, actually I, 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 I don't know how to mow lawn. I don't have a lawnmower, but you do have a lawnmower. So there's a crucial contribution that I need you to make. And in cases uh, where uh, the outcome is, is, is a goal toward, uh, toward which me is currently acting or will soon be acting, then there, there might also be a contribution that uh, the first agent, me, is making. But the, the important point is that there's this crucial, oops, crucial external contribution that's required to bring about the, the outcome or the goal. So that's just the same thing in, in text uh, that we can come back to in the discussion if you want to refer to that, but it's just what I just said. <clears throat> so in situations with that structure, I'll say that a sense of commitment can be elicited. And I'm just introducing this as a theoretical construct and defining it functionally. So uh, when, I say, when I speak of a sense of commitment, I'll be talking about, on the one hand, uh, we can we, we could have to distinguish both, both sides of this. So we can say me, the one agent, has a sense that you is committed to performing X if me expects X to occur because these two conditions obtain. That is because there is this goal uh, for which a crucial contribution X is required on the part of the second agent. And on the other hand, I'll say that you has a sense of being committed to performing X if you is motivated by her belief that me expects her to contribute X. And there's a little hedge here. I'm not sure it has to be a belief. Uh, uh, that, you'll see later why this, this might be relevant. Because I, I actually don't think it has to be a belief uh, that, that some other agent has the expectation. But perhaps cues that some, somebody might have an expectation might well suffice. But that's something that I'd like to discuss later. <clears throat> OK, but then so for one important thing to note about this is that these two things can come apart. So I, I can have a sense that you're committed to, to, to my goal. Uh, without your necessarily feeling motivated to, 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 to contribute to my goal, without you even knowing, perhaps, that I have a sense of being committed to your, to your goal. And the other way around. So, uh, I might, so I might either think that you're committed, but, but you, you're not. Or I might be committed, and you don't, uh, you don't know that I am, or you don't think that I am. So this, this, this can lead to problems, of course, when people uh, uh, have miscommunication or um, uh, c conflicting judgments about when, when commitments are in place. Uh, 
But in any case, the, the question would, of course, arise, why would anybody ever have these motivations or expectations? Why would anyone ever be motivated to contribute just because she thinks she's expected to? Or why would anybody expect somebody to make a contribution to their goal just because it's a contribution to their goal? Well, I think that there are actually a lot of reasons why that is often the case. It's actually a decent default assumption. And just to illustrate this, I want to use one example uh, where we can see a number of different factors at work that would underpin these expectations and motivations. And it's, it's an example that you've, many of you, probably most of you have seen. Oh, actually, this is just a picture. This isn't the video. It doesn't matter. But this is a, an experiment uh, by Felix Warnecken, uh, a so-called spontaneous helping paradigm. Uh, there are many different versions of this. Uh, in, in this experiment, the, the agent, uh, who is Felix Warnecken, is, uh, seems to have the goal of putting books into this cabinet. He puts some books into the cabinet, goes to get more books, and then the door falls shut. And he, again, gets his stack of books, ready to put them in the cabinet, but finds the door shut. And what happens is the little kid, this is an 18-month-old kid, uh, sitting across the room will spontaneously jump up and help and open the door so he can put the books in the cabinet. And there are different, different versions of this, different scenarios, and m many kids do this. The standard interpretation offered, for example, by Felix Warnecken and, um, and others working with Mike Tomasello is that, well, well this illustrates that the, uh, the little kid has a, a, an innate pro-social tendency. So it's a, a concern for the experimenter's well-being that motivates him to jump up and help. And that might be what's going on. And sure, surely that, that motivates some helping behavior, certainly in adults. We're sometimes concerned about others' well-being. But it's a nice example because, it, because many people have been skeptical about that interpretation and have offered other ones. And they're also plausible. And I think it's a nice, uh, so the, the, my aim in, in introducing the example isn't to adjudicate among these interpretations. It's to, to use it as an example to show all the different factors that might be at work in situations like this. So another possibility is. Uh, an aversion to others' distress. So we don't like to see others distressed. It's unpleasant. An 18-month-old in particular might not, might not want to see an adult getting upset. And he has, he's seen adults get upset before when they don't achieve their goals. So he just wants to help in order to avoid dis, uh, signs of distress or conflict. Also a possibility. Another one is a collectivity preference. So young children in particular, but also uh, adults, we tend to like to do things together with people. So the kid might jump up to help just because it seems like a fun thing to do together with somebody. It's better than just sitting alone in the corner. Why not do it? Also uh, plausible. Reputation management. We help others all the time uh, in, in order to maintain our reputations, to look like nice, nice, reliable people. Is that too sophisticated for an 18-month-old? Possibly, possibly not. But uh, later in childhood, and certainly as adults, we do that. Another possible mechanism at work here is what I sometimes uh, call goal slippage. What I, mean, what I mean by that is it could just be that the kid uh, identifying the goal of the agent just takes that up as his goal. And that could happen for many reasons. One possibility is for, for the kid is a good heuristic. If this is a, a goal that the adult is pursuing, then it's probably a, a good thing to bring about. It's in fact the next, it's, it's a, it's likely that the state that the adult is trying to achieve is an objectively good one. It's the thing to do, so I'll just contribute to this. Or it could even be a more basic um, uh, uh, variant of goal slippage. So just by identifying the goal, understanding, representing something as a goal might just by default sort of trigger the motor program for bringing it about, uh, which would then have to get inhibited. And finally, one more possibility here, which I think is quite plausible, is that we have a preference for fulfilling others' expectations or for avoiding disappointing others' expectations. So in this scenario, it's actually quite odd uh, from the child's perspective that the adult, who would, would seem to, to, to know better, is uh, pursuing a strategy that makes no sense at all unless he's expecting somebody to help him. So he's got his hands full of books. He's walking toward the cabinet. The door is closed. It just doesn't make any sense unless he expects somebody to open the door. So it could be that the child is inferring that he's expected to help, and so he, he, he darn well better. And just to illustrate this notion of expectation fulfillment, fulfillment with a couple of other uh, well, uh, experimental examples uh, in adults, this one I find quite interesting. It's uh, uh, a dictator game uh, that Jason Dana uh, carried out a few years ago. So he's, it, was, it was based upon the observation 
his observation that it's actually very strange that in dictator games, people give anything at all. Is anybody not familiar with the dictator game? Would it, uh, okay, all right, so the, it's a very simple economic game. The structure is uh, in, in the same family as, as the prisoner's dilemma, but much simpler. So the structure of this game is simply there, there's a dictator and a recipient. The dictator gets 10 euros or whatever, and then can, can decide how many to give to the recipient, anywhere from zero to 10. And the recipient has no say in it. And people tend to give three or four. And the interesting thing is that, that Jason Dana observed is actually we're always in a dictator game. If, if I've got 10 euros in my pocket and I walk past somebody on the street, I could give them one euro or two euros or three euros. People don't tend to do it, except in laboratories where they consistently do give something. So why do they do that? And his thought was, well, they, they, they feel like they're expected to. They have to give something because somebody, there's this recipient who expects them to give something. So he did a version of the game where, uh, of the experiment where first the rules of the game are introduced to the dictator, but before the recipient is allowed in, the dictator is sort of taken aside and uh, an offer is made. Um, you, can, you can pay me one euro to just go home and the recipient will never know that any of this happened. And they, they, almost all of them are thrilled to pay the euro. So of course, they could just say no and then pay nothing and go home. But they're, they're, it's worth it to them to pay the euro to avoid being confronted with this expectation, which they're going to have to fulfill. And another slightly uh, amusing uh, illustration of this from a, a social psychology study from the 70s that Gartner did, they had, uh, it was done in the US. They had a caller with a, um, an African-American accent call up specifically uh, Republicans and Democrats. So this is actually amusing on most days. Today it probably won't be that amusing. But they, they, and, uh, and, and the caller asks for uh, a request for uh, a donation. And it's to, I can't remember what the charity organization is, but it's one that's supposed to be neutral between uh, party affiliations. So the one thing is uh, not that surprising. Democrats are much more likely to give the contribution if the request is, when the request is made than Republicans. But what's actually interesting is Democrats are more, were more likely than Republicans to hang up the phone before the request could be made. And they interpret that as indicating that many of them kind of knew themselves well enough to know that if this request was made, they would feel pressured to fulfill it. And so they avoid uh, being confronted with the request. They find a way to get out of the conversation and hang up the phone before the request can be made. And before moving on, uh, just one more point that, I, that could be added to this list of possible factors is uh, oftentimes contributing to a, to a joint action that is making a contribution to the bringing about of some goal is just, just uh, done by default because it's part of a script that's activated. It's just the, the next thing that's done in a routine in a situation. So just to illustrate this with, a, with an amusing, amusing example, um, many, most of you will know Darren Brown probably. So what he's done is he's initiated a script where the guy is uh, fulfilling requests. So he asks for something that one would normally, uh, re makes a request that one would normally fulfill, asking for directions. And also, it's kind of a distracting, stressful one because he's asking, he's asking about the pleasure beach. So that's a little bit socially awkward. So the guy's distracted. And then he also asks him what time it is. And I think he hands him his bottle at one point and then takes it back. So he's also got this script going where we're handing things back and forth. And you're fulfilling my requests. And then just slips in the request for the wallet. And he just goes along with it because it just seems like part of the script. And he's, he's, he's distracted. So that's just to illustrate that just going along with scripts like this is, a, is another thing that, that people frequently do and that we can rely, often rely upon people doing. So we have these these many factors that motivate us to make these contributions to others' to others' goals or goals. And we all know that other, others have these motivations because we do too. And that leads us to expect others to, by default at least, unless there's a good reason not to, to make these contributions. And of course, the expectations themselves are also put pressure on us. So these, these different motiv motivating factors and expectations have a kind of mutually reinforcing or stabilizing effect. All right, so what this way of thinking about the, uh, uh, the sense of commitment provides us with is a graded concept. So any factors that, mo that, that uh, uh, modulate expectations or motivation in situations with this minimal structure uh, can, can be said to enhance the sense of commitment. 
And so factors like, or uh, components that, that would feature as necessary conditions for commitment in the strict sense feature here as modulating factors. So uh, having caused an agent to, to expect X, so that is, that's a necessary feature of commitment in the strict sense. You tell them or otherwise give an assurance that you're going to do X. Here, causing, causing somebody, like in the case of the dog, I cause the dog to expect to play, to play fetch. This enhances my sense of commitment to playing fetch with him. In that case, I didn't do so intentionally. In the case of in commitment in the strict sense, of course, one has to intentionally uh, gi uh, uh, give rise to somebody's expectations. In the case of the dog, I didn't do so intentionally. But if I did do so intentionally by waving the ball in front of his nose until he gets up, then it would be even, even worse not to play fetch with him. And again, and these other factors that I, that I also already uh, discussed can enhance expectations and motivations. And one other factor that uh, we thought might be an important modulating factor is the degree of coordination with a joint action. And this uh, was the starting point in the hypothesis for the, the first study that I'm going to um, present to you uh, involving this pile of sand. But first, uh, a word on coordination. So as any good philosopher in beginning to think about coordination, I. I didn't just sit in my armchair and consult my intuitions. I did a little bit of experimental philosophy and Googled it. And I found that coordination uh, can be defined as a balanced and effective interaction of movement actions or a harmonious adjustment of action, especially of muscles and bodily movements. Those are very broad definitions. Uh, slightly more usefully, there's a nice distinction in a paper by Gunter Knobles and colleagues, 2011, between what they call emergent coordination and planned coordination. So for emergent coordination, you can think about phenomena like perception, action, coupling, I scratch my nose, you scratch yours, this chameleon effect kind of stuff. That, will, that fulfills this definition. So there's a harmonious adjustment of action, balanced and effective interaction of movements, et cetera. Uh, same goes for entrainment. If we're rocking in rocking chairs next to each other, we'll tend to entrain to the same, um, uh, same period. And, and, and there are other examples of what they call emergent coordination. But What's interesting here is so-called planned coordination, where agents' behavior is driven by representations specifying the goal of joint action and the individual contributions to the goal. So where the harmonious adjustment of action, et cetera, happens in the service of bringing about some goal. So why might planned coordination enhance the sense of commitment? Well, the thought is when we have highly coordinated joint action, we have interdependent, which is to say mutually contingent, action plans. So each agent, in order for the thing to go off, must have and rely upon expectations about what the other agent is going to do. So performing a contribution within a highly coordinated joint action expresses an expectation as well as a reliance upon that expectation. So the thought is, like with our example with the experimenter Felix with the books, uh, he wouldn't do it that way if he wasn't expecting the other agent to make some contribution. So just by performing your contribution within a highly coordinated joint action where your, your contribution only makes sense on the assumption that somebody else is going to make some other contribution, performing that contribution makes salient your expectation about what they're going to do, which may apply social pressure upon the other to perform her contribution in order to avoid disappointing the expectation and making her efforts go wasted. So to test this, we, had, we set up a situation where, so this was a, just an observational study. We had people watching videos online. And the, the background scenario here was we told them that this, this one guy has the task of cleaning up a big pile of sand this morning. And he thinks it'll take about an hour. And then as he's cleaning up the pile of sand, his neighbor walks by, finds his way blocked by the pile of sand, and decides to help for a bit. So the neighbor has, at least for a moment, uh, a selfish motive to contribute to uh, moving the sand. But the pile of sand is getting lower and lower. And so very quickly, very soon, it will be possible for the helper to get by. So his in initial motive doesn't provide him with, a, with, a, with any reason to remain engaged in the joint action and to clean up more sand than necessary. So we showed people two versions of this, a highly coordinated version and a less coordinated version. Actually, since the actors are my friends uh, and they're lousy actors, neither, the, the highly coordinated version is actually not that persuasive as highly coordinated, but it's more coordinated than the other one. So you'll see that in the high coordination version, well, first, nope, his way is blocked by the pile of sand, very persuasive. 
decides to help. So you'll see they form a chain. So the one guy fills the bucket and passes it on, the other then empties it out. And then the other one, they're just walking past each other. So they have to stay out of each other's way, but it's not as coordinated as the, the version over here. And so the thought was, in the more coordinated version, uh, people will perceive a higher degree of commitment. So they'll, they'll expect him to stay and help longer. So we asked people, <clears throat> how long do you think he'll continue to help? We also asked, uh, how long do you think his neighbor expects him to help, since we're interested in the role of expectations in mediating between coordination and commitment. And we had a couple of control questions. We asked people how effective they thought the joint action was. And the reason for that was we were concerned that some people might think, well, the highly coordinated version is more effective. So uh, it's more helpful. It's more useful. So in abandoning the highly coordinated joint action, he would be depriving the helpy of a greater good. So he might, he might be more reluctant to do so out of general prosociality, simply because it would be depriving the person of a greater good. So we, were, we did control the two strategies for effectiveness, the same number of steps and buckets per minute and everything. But people might have perceived it, uh, the coordinated version as more effective. So we wanted to check on that. We also asked people whether he had any, they thought that the helper had any obligation to help. Because the prediction was that they wouldn't see any obligation, think there was any obligation to help, but that nevertheless their more intuitive judgments about commitment would uh, would reveal a difference. So we did in fact find uh, a main effect of coordination on perceived commitment. So that is the amount of time they predicted that the person would continue helping. There was no significant effect on uh, for the second question about how long the neighbor would expect him to help, although there was a very high correlation between. Uh, the amount of time that they predicted the helper would help and the amount of time that they thought the helpie would expect the helper to help. So it's kind of strange that there was no significant effect. It was close, uh, but um, in any case, there was no significant effect for either of the control questions, so that was nice. But then why was there no significant effect on coordination of coordination for the question about expectations? Well, a couple of things to observe. One is that uh, a great many people gave 30, whoops, gave 30 as their response. And so we think that since we told them, oh, the guy expects it to take about an hour, now they might have thought, oh, okay, so if it's going to take an hour, the other guy's helping him, 60 divided by 2 is 30, done. So they just did a quick calculation without really uh, uh, um, imagining being in the situation. And another thing to point out is that for the, the, the question about how long he'll continue to help, actually nobody said zero. Whereas for the question about expectations, about 30 people said zero. That suggested to us that maybe some people were interpreting the question about expectations in a more normative light. So how long would he be expected to? Or how long would it be appropriate to expect him to help? Some might have interpreted it that way. So we did a follow-up experiment where we wanted to uh, in encourage people to en engage in perspective taking uh, on, on the one hand in order to prevent them taking a detached strategy and arriving at uh, uh, an answer, and also to avoid this uh, normative interpretation of the expectations question. So oh yes, and, and one other change that we introduced was instead of uh, uh, giving them numbers as anchors, we asked them how long he'll continue to help in terms of uh, well, the sand that is moved. So not at all a few buckets until half the sand is cleaned up, until most of the sand is cleaned up, or until the job is complete. And the other the reason for introducing this perspective taking factor, so having people answer questions where they're taking the perspective of the actors, was the following. So we thought it could be the case that we were right, that in an, a coordinated joint action, by doing your part, you make salient your expectation about what the other is going to do next. But that the reason why that makes a difference might, might have nothing to do with putting social pressure on others to fulfill those exp expectations. It might rather be that the people watching these videos don't know what's going on. They don't know the actors in the videos, and they just take take this as their heuristic, as their best indication of what's going to happen next. Oh, the guy seems to expect the other guy to help. So, so that, that might lead them to give higher estimates without this effect being, uh, having anything to do with the social pressure to fulfill expectations. So we, so we asked them, if you were in Thomas' situation, how long would you help? And we thought, that should only make a difference. They should only give higher estimates in that condition if somehow imagining being in the situation and feeling the social pressure to fulfill the expectations makes a difference. And that's what we found. So there was a significant main effect of coordination on perceived commitment, and also a significant main effect of perspective taking on perceived commitment. Uh, 
We also found a significant main effect of coordination on the question about expectations, so how long the neighbor expects him to help now in the perspective taking version, as well as a significant main effect of perspective taking on, uh, of, uh, sorry, of, of both of coordination and of perspective taking on attributed expectations. No interaction. But the interesting thing here is when they were asked to take the perspective of the helpee, they actually gave lower estimates of how long uh, they expected the person to help. So it might be that in taking his perspective, they're still interpreting the question as pertaining to norms. How long would I be entitled to expect him to help? And so this, they, this leads them to give low, even lower estimates because they want to disavow uh, any, uh, any normative demands that they would place on the other. That's a possibility. But uh, that wasn't something we predicted, so that's, that's just a post hoc explanation. Again, uh, no significant effect on the uh, control questions there. And just for completeness, we did uh, one further experiment where we changed the scenario a little bit just to try to generalize it. So the tempting outside option was not to get by. So we didn't tell them that the helper was helping in order to get by. We don't tell them anything about why the neighbor is helping in the first place. But at some point, his phone rings and the video stops. And we ask, how likely is it that he'll take the call? How likely is it that you would take the call? And the same control question about effectiveness. But here, instead of asking about obligations, we asked something a little bit lighter, subtler. Uh, how appropriate or inappropriate would it be to take the call? And so here, again, we've got the same, uh, same main effects of coordination upon perceived commitment and first person perceived commitment. So that is how, uh, the likelihood that they themselves would take the call if they're in the situation. And now also a significant effect of coordination on their judgments about how appropriate it would be to take the call. That was, that, that was interesting because they had the, the, the question about obligations had not made a difference, but the question about appropriateness does seem to make a difference. So that might tap into something a little bit uh, less explicitly pertaining to norms and obligations. So to sum that up, we have some evidence that coordination can enhance uh, at least perceived commitment and joint action, independently of explicit judgments about obligations. And with respect to the mechanism, the hypothesis was that making expectations salient triggers a preference to fulfill those expectations. And the perspective taking results in experiment two suggest that this is not just because revealed expectations serve as a heuristic. So to come to the last part, uh, a new study where we're looking at the effects of costs invested upon uh, the sense of commitment and joint action. This is based upon the snake game, which many of you know, but some of you might not know. It's a classic mobile phone game where you move a snake around on a screen to collect apples as they appear. And each time you eat an apple, the snake gets longer, and the snake can't go back over itself, so it gets increasingly difficult. Also, the snake can't leave the screen, because then it would die. So this is the classic version of the snake game that many of you might remember. It's, it's entrancing and captivating to play and to watch. So we did a different version of this, where instead of getting increasingly exciting as the game goes along, it gets increasingly boring. First of all, the snake doesn't get any longer. Uh, it can go back on itself without dying. It can leave the screen, and it just comes back the other side. And the apples appear at an ever slowing rate. So after about 30 seconds, it starts to get boring. After about a minute, it's really tedious. Nothing is happening. So we had a version of it. That's just da, da, da. Actually, I'm going to do that later. So we had the, a, a joint version of this task where one uh, person, the participant, controls left, right, and somebody else, the confederate, controls up, down. And the dependent variable is persistence. So they play 20 rounds of this game. And as I said, it gets increasingly boring during the course of the game. And we tell them. You can stop any time. It's your job to decide when to stop this round and move on to the next one. And what, what we manipulate is the cost that they take their partner to have to invest. So we tell them, at the beginning of each round, your partner has to do a, a, a task that's either difficult or easy to unlock the game. And we give them an example of an easy task, which is to decipher this captcha, this series of letters. They just have to decipher this. The, uh, and the difficult one is to decipher this long, blurry one, which I think is basically impossible to decipher. But in fact, nobody's ever deciphering anything at all. We have an algorithm doing that. What participants see at the beginning of each round is something like this. It says, wait until your partner unlocks the next round by solving a capture. And they just see these little stars appearing to indicate that their partner is solving the capture. And you see it's, this one takes a while. 
Ugh. Looks effortful, yeah. And then the other condition is just a very short one that the, the partner solves quickly. And then they play the snake game. So we first did a, a pilot of this with a human uh, confederate. So the, part, the participant was playing with a with human confederate, but it was an algorithm actually doing the, the capture. And in fact, we found longer persistence in the high effort condition. So when their partner solved a longer capture, they persisted longer. So we did this as a pilot with six participants. And, uh, there were a couple of issues with it, so it wasn't properly blinded. And it turns out to do that properly, we, uh, we have to reprogram the whole thing. So that's going to take a little bit of time. So in the meantime, we did a version of it where we thought, well, actually, for the hypothesis, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be necessary that it's, that it's a human participant that they're playing with. Just cues of effort and, and uh, being invested into the joint task could suffice. So we programmed a, a, a virtual partner, the Robo Snake, and did a, uh, an experiment where we actually just told people that you're playing with a, with a virtual partner. And it still makes a difference, interestingly. So one, one uh, objection or concern that was raised was that maybe what's happening is that it takes longer. They have to wait longer for the long capture than for the short capture. So it's their own investment of waiting time that makes the difference. So we did a control experiment. Everything was the same, except we didn't tell them anything about the background story. We, they just they see this, these stars appearing, and we tell them, just, just wait until the next round begins. There's nothing about there being a task. So everything is perceptually the same, except the background story about the task. They have to wait longer, uh, but there's no effect. And so to come back to coordination, we would like to do a version of this where we test whether coordination makes a difference. Uh, using an actual interactive task, because in the sand task, people are just watching, they're just participants to an interaction. So here, the th here it's actually quite difficult, and in general, it's quite difficult to manipulate coordination because, or to manipulate coordination while keeping the task demands constant, because if something is more coordinated, then you're doing something different from when it's less coordinated. So here, for example, what we're going to do is we'll have in the coordination condition, it's just the same as before. You're controlling this snake. You're doing left, right. Your partner's doing up, down. You're going for red apples. And then there's this other snake that you have nothing to do with that's going for yellow apples. But you, you can't get yellow apples. It can't get red apples. And you can't interfere with each other at all. So this is, in terms of task demands, the same as the, as the, the one we just did. But now we can have a, a second condition where uh, the participant would control all four directions for this snake, and the other player would control all four directions for that snake. So here, the task demands are different. So we wouldn't know. If they persist longer in the coordinated, coordinated version, it could be that it's more fun or um, easier. We wouldn't know that. So the thought is that if we cross this with costs invested, what we should find is main effect of investment. So the partner does the long capture compared to the short capture. They persist longer in the high, in, in high effort or high investment than in the low investment. Main effect of coordination, so where it's coordinated, when they're, con they're control coordinating the snake with somebody else, they should persist longer than when they're not doing so. But we should hopefully also see an interaction. So they should be more sensitive to their partner's investment in the high coordination condition than the lower, lo uh, low coordination condition. So that's the, that's, the, that's the hope, because then, although task demand, differences in task demands could explain this main effect here, uh, they wouldn't explain that interaction. OK, so then just to close with this slide here. So the, I think it's intuitive that the costs that I invest in a joint action might often make you feel more committed to the joint action. But it's not that clear exactly why that, that, that should be the case. So there are a couple of different reasons why it could be the case. One. And we'd like to tease these, these apart in future experiments. So that's why I'm going to close by putting these on the table. And there might be other possibilities as well. But so one possibility is that my investment of effort is a cue to my future investment, the likelihood that I'm going to continue investing and making a contribution. So if, if that's the case, then, then my making an effort is an indication to you that it's, it's worth remaining engaged because I'm likely to do so as well. It's one possibility. That would be functional. That would be a, could be a useful heuristic. Another is that it could be a cue to expectations. So if we think expectations are playing an important role, as, as I suggested earlier, then my investment of effort or other costs 
could be an indication to you that I expect you to do your part because otherwise I wouldn't make this effort or I wouldn't make this investment. So that's a possibility. Another possibility is that by investing effort or making other, uh, uh, by putting effort in or other investments into this joint action, I indicate that this is a valuable goal, this is a valuable activity. So it just might lead you also to take that as a heuristic that this, this is a goal worth prioritizing. In that case, uh, you might, for example, continue to, to, to be committed and, and to persist longer, even if I'm no longer your partner, but somebody else is, because I have indicated that this is a worthwhile goal, but it might not be even necessary for me to continue to be your partner. And one further option that, uh, that, that we're considering is social sunk costs. So it, I don't think there's any research looking into this yet, but it, uh, it's possible that, at least in some cases, people might have a tendency to honor sunk costs in general. So not just their own sunk costs, but sunk costs paid by others. So I, uh, I, I don't know of any research on that. I'd be thrilled to hear if anybody knows of any. And, and that might be limited to cases where the costs are invested by an in-group member or somebody I perceive, perceive to be a team member. I'm not sure. So any, any of those might be uh, uh, at work in this, this experiment. Uh, and so we would like to identify uh, follow-up experiments to sort of tease apart these different possibilities. But for now, I'll just close by mentioning that so Guntor, Knoblich, and Natalie Zevans are uh, my close collaborators on this. We've developed the theoretical framework together. And now Steve Butterfield, my colleague at work, has helped to design these experiments along with uh, Clément Letesson, my postdoc. And Marcel uh, Seke is uh, a research assistant in Budapest who actually came up with the idea of using the snake game and did all the programming and collected the data. So um, thanks especially to him and to you. <laughs>